President. Mr. President, I beg to move the following motion, standing in my name. Whereas the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, Chapter 101, entrenches the principle of separation of powers between the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary, which ensures the protection of citizens and a system of checks and balances in the exercise of power. And whereas the Constitution provides protection to all constitutionally enshrined offices and institutions, and whereas the actions of the government in its engagement with constitutionally enshrined offices and institutions have caused public unease and concern. Be it resolved that this Senate calls on the government to reaffirm its commitment to the principles and the practice of democracy in Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. President, I rise today in the Senate because as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, and being given the privilege to serve in this honorable Senate. It is my duty to raise matters which continues to be of concern, not to the opposition, not to just members who sit in these hallowed halls and who come here on a weekly basis, but to every single citizen of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Vice President, if we are to live in a functioning democracy, we must have recognition and respect for the doctrine of separation of powers. And whilst we oftentimes speak of separation of powers in terms of the separation of the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary, we must understand that in order to safeguard a citizen for, and their fundamental rights and freedoms guaranteed to them by the Constitution, and to guard against tyranny or dictatorship, we must ensure that there is no concentration of power and that all the independent institutions that are set up, whether through the Constitution or separate pieces of legislation, that they are allowed and permitted to function efficiently and effectively. We had a debate in this House just yesterday about commissions of inquiry and the role and function that they play. And there was an agreement and consensus amongst the members of this House that commissions of inquiry carry out an important function. But what I highlighted yesterday, and what I will mention again today, is that who is going to stand as the watchdog, the check and the balance on the executive, when millions of dollars are spent on a commission of inquiry and there's no implementation? That essentially characterizes why we have separation of powers, and it highlights the need for us to ensure there are institutions, independent institutions, which cannot be starved of resources, which cannot be, have their power whittled away by the government's majority in the parliament. Institutions which have to be given the teeth and the legislative authority to perform their functions. If we look at what really is democracy and the separation of powers, it goes way back to centuries of philosophical thinking. And the French social and political thinker Montesquieu, who said, when the legislative and executive powers are united in the same person or in the same body of magistrates, there can be no liberty. There is no liberty if the powers of judging are not separated from the legislative and executive. There would be an end to everything if the same man or the same body were to exercise those three powers. And that's just a very high level philosophical description of what separation of powers is supposed to mean. You must never have a concentration of power and no arm of the state should be allowed to interfere in the functioning of another arm. So separate institutions are created as checks and balances on each other. And we, if we are to avoid bias, corruption, conflict of interest, and to ensure that there is no perception of such, we must ensure that there is no concentration of power. As, again, mentioned in the debate yesterday, there are different um, legal systems. And in our Westminster-style legal system, we don't have clear-cut separation of powers, and mention has been made of the American system, where the president and the cabinet completely separate from the 
Congress, their, their um, legislature, and also they have some overlap in terms of the appointment of judicial officers, but they also have elected judicial officers. And we don't really have that system here. But that just makes it even more important that when we do have appointments to independent institutions that they are allowed to function properly. And the importance of our sovereign democratic state as defined in section one, beginning of our constitution, the preamble which recites the core beliefs that the authors of our constitution agreed upon and encapsulated into that very important document. If we are to preserve that, then we must look at how any government performs its functions. And when we notice that there are things being done or things being said that doesn't sit well and does not accord with these fundamental principles that are enshrined in our constitution, we must speak out about it without fear of criticism and without, I would say, the typical tit for tat, who did what when, who did more and who did worse. Because if we are looking forward as a nation and we want to preserve our way of life and our liberty, we must correct ourselves wherever we may have gone wrong. In the uh, much celebrated and well-known case of um, Curati in the Privy Council, it said that the idea of democracy involved a number of different concepts, including first, that people must decide who should govern them, secondly, that fundamental rights should be protected by an impartial and independent judiciary, and thirdly, that to reconcile the inevitable tensions between these ideas, a separation of powers between legislative, executive, and judiciary was necessary. The demarcation of these functions um, is well recited in many decisions. And Mr. Vice President, Mr. President, sorry. Although the word separation of powers do not actually feature in our constitution, the principle, as has been said in many cases coming out of our highest court, the apex court, the Privy Council, is that the principle of separation of powers is not some overriding supra-constitutional principle, but a description of how the powers under a real constitution are divided. In the well -known, another well-known case of Chandler, they have said that they have taken the view that the doctrine of separation of powers is not an overriding principle that exists independently of a constitution, but is implicit in a constitution, having regard to the powers of the judiciary, legislature, and the executive, which are laid down expressly or by implication in the Constitution. So that in everything that we do, and in, in everything that each arm of the state does, they must be mindful that the separation of powers and the non-interference in the functioning of important institutions is in fact implied. Where do we find ourselves here today, Mr. President? We find ourselves with a government that unfortunately has been characterized, and I think will go down in history, as being defined by attempts to delay elections, criticisms and attacks levied against independent officers such as the DPP and the Integrity Commission, the buffing of the media and private citizens when they voice criticism or concern over particular matters, secret indemnity deals struck without the knowledge of the Director of Public Prosecutions, what? A merit list that can go missing and a police service commission that can collapse. On that, Attempts to interfere with the process of appointing the commissioner of police and utilizing their majority in parliament to weaken watchdog institutions like the office of the procurement regulator. Wow. That is what we are facing here today, Mr. President, and it is the obligation of all right-thinking citizens to question these attempts, because if we do not do that, these actions will erode the independence of our autonomous public offices and institutions. There will be a growing loss of confidence in our state institutions, and we will the efficient functioning of our state institutions and public offices, which seek to provide transparency and accountability on behalf of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago will be no more. And that is why today, Mr. President, I am here to call on the government to cease and desist from their blatant interference 
blatant interference in state institutions, public offices, and to cease as well, and I have to say because of recent developments, to cease the relentless attacks on those whose job it is to hold them to account. And that is what we are here to discuss by way of this particular motion. Now, our Constitution says that men and institutions will remain free only when there is respect for the rule of law. Have we seen a respect for the rule of law by this particular government? And how does the population, because at the end of the day, as I mentioned, I believe that public perception is just as important as what is actually happening. And the government tries to justify and explain away some of their missteps. But what does the public perception say? On the 18th of May, 2023, there was a report published and an article published uh, in the Express newspaper captioned, TNT scores low in rule of law survey. And I will quote from that article published in the Express on that day, which says, Trinidad and Tobago has scored low in a rule of law survey with 80% of respondents of the view that top government officials attack or attempt to discredit the media and civil society organizations that criticize them. Citizens are also of the view that top government officials attack or try to discredit the country's electoral system. Compared to their regional counterparts, respondents in Trinidad and Tobago most often felt that top government officials attack or attempt to discredit the media and civil society organizations that criticize them, resort to misinformation to shape public opinion in their favor, 75% said that, attack or attempt to discredit the electoral system and other supervisory organs, 72%, seek to influence the promotion and removal of judges, 68%, and seek to limit the court's competencies and freedom to interpret the law, 64%. This was a study conducted by the World Justice Project, and it was published last year. Subsequently, and of course, this is a debate that we began in the last session, but subsequently, we've had even more international bodies coming out and levying criticism when it comes to transparency and accountability. In fact, the 2023 um, Transparency International Report on Trinidad and Tobago, I felt hurt and almost ashamed when I read the, the things said in that report about our um, ranking on the Corruption Perception Index and the perception that people had of our judiciary. Now, the Law Association came out in defense of the judiciary, and of course, the judiciary is trying to defend itself. But it was reported in the newspaper in February of 2024, 5th of February 2024, this is in the Newsday newspaper, where the report Transparency International raised its issue, its 2023 Corruption Perception Index, claimed that the judiciary had not fulfilled its role to keep other branches of government in check. It said a country's failed judiciary entrenched in corruption negatively impacts the quality of life of citizens as persons are hesitant to avail themselves of services for fear of retributions. Therefore, under an ineffectual judiciary, corruption will continue to thrive, thus devastating the country as a whole. People tend to get defensive when these comments are made and say we cannot levy criticism against the judiciary. But at the end of the day, these reports are based on surveys, interviews, reports that come out from different persons in the media about people's confidence. So I am not saying that we have a judiciary riddled in corruption. I would never say such a thing. Never. I would never be so um, broad brush with my comments. But what is the perception of citizens when it comes to the administration of justice in Trinidad and Tobago? And how has this government affected it? That is a critical question which we must continue to ask. So I want to focus on a couple of these institutions, because you see, if our institutions are not functioning, it whittles away at public confidence. It whittles away at the entire notion that citizens have rights and that there are institutions empowered to protect those rights.
When you look at laws like Freedom of Information Act, for example, that law was passed by a UNC administration because it is seen as an important tool to give citizens access to information. As I heard one person once say, that is the piece of law that opens up the filing cabinets of every ministry and state body and allows the citizen to get down into the granular details of decision making by state bodies and how they utilize their power. And this government has seen it fit to try to remove bodies from under the purview of freedom of information and exempt them. This government has consistently gone to the courts to object and to defend and to try their best not to disclose information under the Freedom of Information Act, depriving citizens of access to information. One very clear example is the issue of TSCT. There is the issue of TSCT being a 51% majority owned state enterprise that says that it should not be subject to the Freedom of Information Act, even though they have members of a board appointed by the government, even though the expenditure of TSCT is something that we are now looking at. And they are seeking to remove that level of oversight and accountability when you look at enterprises such as those. The government's removal of various areas of purview from the oversight of the procurement regulator is another critical issue. And it will go down in history that a very strong piece of legislation passed after decades of conversation about procurement in this country and several private, body, um, private bodies and, and, and lobbying groups and so on were consulted and a piece of legislation passed by the People's Partnership Administration in order to bring more transparency and to try to get rid of some of the corruption that occurs when you have public procurement, this government consistently whittled away at the powers of the procurement regulator, removing key types of services from the purview of that office. How could that be in the interest of democracy? How could it, we say that we have a functioning democracy when by simple majority, a government uses that majority in this parliament to achieve such a, 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 a you know, I would say almost immoral purpose. Yeah. Now, so. we've also seen attacks against the service commissions. The entire process of appointing a commissioner of police has found its way into the court system on more than one occasion under this administration. The first was the case of when the case, uh, a retired police officer by the name of Haridat Maraj had to bring a case because the government sought to amend an order that inserted the Minister of National Security into the process of recruiting and appointing a commissioner of police. And that had to be struck down by the courts. Thankfully, the United National Congress, standing in the gap, took the matter to court. Because what the court said is there is no reason in logic why an independent police service commission cannot itself trigger the process for recruitment. It is clear that the ability to influence and, in fact, control the decision as to whether or not an appointment process should be initiated carries with it the ability to influence the outcome of that process. Those are the words of, not the UNC, but of then Justice Rajkumar, who presided over that matter. And he, that it comes directly from his judgment. Now, again, thereafter, we had amendments to the same order, or a different order. I can't recall which one it was, where they sought to bring, um, make appointments for acting commissioners of police. And this is when the government found itself in a pickle because a merit list was submitted and coincidentally on the same day there was a meeting and a merit list was withdrawn. Imagine a merit list produced after a supposedly independent service commission carried out its function of recruiting and selecting people and producing a merit list could be withdrawn because of interference. 
and subsequently an entire service commission collapsed. And for the first time in the history of this country, we did not have a commissioner of police or a police service commission. Down to the government. Why? Because people do not have respect for the separation of powers. And they do not have respect for important and key institutions that are set up under our constitution that are meant to preserve our democracy. That is all. That is the fundamental underlying reason for why that entire process took place, or that whole scandal took place. And then we move forward now, and we see that the order that they passed trying to appoint an acting commissioner of police was bypassing the, 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 the constitution and the process. So we took them to court again. And I'm very proud to say that, you know, in both those matters, the one, uh, this one, as well as the one, the higher marriage one, that I was competently led by eminent senior counsel, Mrs. Pasad Bissessa and Mr. Ramdogat. And I'm very proud to associate myself with both those matters because, you know, I speak to a lot of police officers in the course of my, my job, my duties, and you would not believe the feedback and I, I think that that's the problem with this government. You know, they live in a bubble and they don't listen to what people are saying. But the feedback that you get when you're involved in matters like that from the average constable and corporal on the ground is that they feel that they have no power when these things are being done and they are happy to see someone stand up for their rights. Because they have to function as part of a police service that is constantly under political attack by this government. They are the ones running down bandits, going to court, working 24, 48-hour shifts, trying to solve crime with very little resources. And they see themselves as being part of a system under attack by a government. So we took them to court again, and we ensured that that whole process of bypassing the constitutional requirements for acting appointments and so on was struck down, and then we ended up with no commissioner of police because of them. They collapsed the whole service commission, and we had nobody to carry out the recruitment exercise. Did they learn? Well, last week we found out that they didn't. Because believe it or not, they brought a bill to the House of Representatives last week trying to do the exact same thing. Hmm. trying to remove parliamentary oversight for acting appointments as commissioner of police. Why? What is their justification? It's an administrative burden. It's too hard. It's too much work to have to come here and bring a notification to the parliament when we want to appoint somebody to act because they want to go to a conference somewhere. Nobody, I listened to that debate very carefully, nobody identified a specific instance where the commissioner of police was required to go somewhere or do something and couldn't do it because they didn't have time to come to the parliament. Eh? But that is the reason and that is the justification. Having to come to parliament to get somebody to approve an acting appointment in an office as important as the office of commissioner of police and allowing parliamentary oversight in accordance with the constitution is too much work for them to do. So they came to the parliament to try to remove it. Well, thankfully, the citizens of this country still have some right-thinking people holding public office in the form of the opposition, and we do not allow it. And we will never allow that. Because every time they come to this parliament, whether it is for making, passing orders, regulations, or whatever, they try their best to do away with parliamentary oversight. Mm -hmm. Everything must be negative resolution. Everything should just sometimes no res subject to no resolution at all. Let's do, let's do it. That's one of the first things Senator Mark and I look for when we get a bill. How are they making regulations and whether there is any requirement for them to come to parliament? Because that is their modus operandi, remove parliamentary oversight. And that speaks directly, directly to the separation of powers. It speaks directly to the whittling away of that level of oversight and accountability and the checks and balances that the Constitution and the framers of our Constitution and worldwide recognized principles of any functioning democracy. And that is what this government keeps trying to get rid of. And it is consistent and it is blatant and it is never ending. And sometimes it is exhausting that I feel sometimes the six of us here alone standing up thinking right. 
and they come back again every time we have these debates and we raise these issues. They come back with their same attempts. On three occasions, Mr. President, three occasions, there have been attempts to interfere with the appointment of a commissioner of police by this government. They are so obsessed with getting control, control, control. over the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service that they are relentless in their attacks. Yes. When we have situations, let me move on from the Office of the Commissioner of Police, and I will talk about the Office of the DPP. We had a situation in this country where the DPP was left out and had no knowledge of government ministers, private attorneys, and the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service being involved in the signing off of an indemnity agreement for a person to become a state witness. The person who occupies the Office of Director of Public Prosecutions, the constitutionally enshrined office under Section 90 of our Constitution, the person who must be the most, if I may dare say, the most independent office holder in this country because of the amount of power that that person can yield. is not only left out of conversations, he's also deprived of financial and technical resources, and there are administrative lines through which there is direct interference in his office. And I make no apologies for saying so, because subsequent to our discussions on these matters, Mr. Mr. President, the director himself appeared before a joint select committee of national security where there were inquiries made of him. And I had the opportunity to question the director of public prosecutions at the time because there was a public, again, public attack against this man over a building. A public attack against what should be an independent office and an independent office holder who must be free to exercise his powers without free and fair and free from fair, being publicly attacked on a political platform because security experts had raised concerns about a building and so he did not feel that he should move his staff into that building until those concerns had been addressed. And a person no less than the Prime Minister mounted a political platform to launch a scathing attack against this man. So he, be he came before the Joint Select Committee of Parliament and we had the opportunity to question him. And we moved on from the building issue, but we were dealing with the human resourcing of the office because no office, regardless of how independent the head of that office might be, can really function unless they have resources. And I, I specifically asked about the hiring of contract staff versus permanent staff. And I specifically asked the director whether or not he felt, because he expressed the view on a radio program, I believe, that hiring of permanent staff for an office such as the DPP's office would be more appropriate because people will not be holding on to the political directorate to have their contracts renewed. That is common sense. That's common sense, quite frankly. But the fact that the man had to go and say that because he was only being provided with contract staff by the office of the Attorney General. And this is what the, um, the director had to say in response to my question on, for a comment on that matter. He said, it has been more than 10 years now that I would have advocated for a budget for the DPP's office so as to ensure we could do certain things. What seems to me to be an anomaly is in fact that other so-called independent institutions have their own budgets. I then asked him about having his own line in a budget, like some other institutions and so on. He said, my situation is different. Let me spectacularly highlight my situation, perhaps. And I'm reading directly from the verbatim notes of this meeting. Some time ago, someone who occupied the chair of Attorney General had a conflict with someone who occupied the chair of DPP. During the pendency of that conflict, the DPP's office would have, or before the conflict crystallized, the DPP's office would have arranged to have a retreat and a training session with staff. 
Because of the conflict, that Attorney General, in his wisdom, then decided to indicate to the DPP that because of that conflict, he is not willing to allocate any resources for the training event. This is not fiction. I am not being hypothetical. This happened as a fact, and I am speaking from my own knowledge. So it stands to reason that if we are speaking truly about an independent office, and this is an office whose independence finds itself in the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago, it cannot be that if we want a scanner that would turn on, what is, what is to say the complexion of my relationship with the incumbent Attorney General or any of his predecessors cannot, that cannot and should not be. The director raised the issue because at the time, comments had been made about his office being underperforming. And I wanted to know how an office being deprived of resources, being criticized, not being given physical space that was appropriate for them to occupy in order to accommodate their staff could be criticized for underperforming. But that is, again, part of this government's way of doing things. They deprive people of the resources that they need. They do not make appointments. They don't give the financial or technical resources. They do not invest in training. And then they criticize these institutions and say, this one isn't working, that one isn't working. We must get rid of all of them. Let us look at the TTRA. We, have, we had, for all of eternity, Customs and Excise Division, yes, understaffed, not the most efficient. We had the Board of Inland Revenue, they say we have tax leakages, they are not efficient in doing their job. We must get rid of all the public servants who are insulated and protected by the Service Commission and form a TTRA with a board appointed by a minister. And the minister must be able to come to the parliament now and produce a name of a director general, but he can veto the person who goes through the process, which he did to be the Director General and then bring the name here and get it approved. Why? Because customs doesn't work. Why does customs not work? Again, when you ask questions, you realize scanners have broken down for over a year and they have not replaced them. The resources are not there to ensure that people are appointed to important offices. Everybody acting. There, there are no permanent appointments being made. You have issues in the public service. But it is because of the government not doing what it needs to do to make the public service efficient. Exactly. So it's like you destroy someone and then you criticize them for their performance. And that is what happened when that is why, that is all the justification that they have had and that they have used to disband the Board of Inland Revenue and the Customs and Excise Division and bring, you know, when we talked about, um, you know, uh, uh, the police service being coming a private army, we now have a private tax army. A private taxation army is what they want to create, where they will control revenue collection, they will control all of the persons working in the TTRA, and they will control, and contract officers. Again, the director of public prosecutions made the point, contract officers are beholden to the political directorate for renewal of their contracts, and that has now translated itself from various arms of the public service into what will be known as the TTRA, who will be collecting property tax, income tax, and all the other taxes, because you know, that is part of their plan for the country, impose as many taxes as they can and collect them. Can people have confidence in a country that is being run in this manner? I dare say no. And that is why we are here today to raise it. The Integrity Commission, another feature of good governance introduced by UNC administration, Integrity in Public Life Act meant to hold government officials to account. Mr. Vice President, Mr. President, I could not fathom how it is a sitting Prime Minister and supported by members who sit in this house and elsewhere can criticize a public body for saying that they wanted additional funding to be able to carry out their functions. Their functions are very clearly defined within the law. And if a body needs funding and they articulate that need by way of a report that they have to put, um, publish every year, a responsible government, 
a government with respect for democracy, with respect for the separation of powers, with respect for our constitution, would address those concerns. Instead, what you have happening is on the 4th of January this year, and I'm quoting from an article published in the Trinidad Guardian, titled, Rowley Slams IC Boss Over Funding Complaint. And let me read what is said in this report. Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley has hit back at Integrity Commission Chairman Rajendra Ram Logan's complaint over reduced funding for the Commission's work. All right, it wasn't just a complaint about funding, it was a complaint about reduced funding. Crappy, I read that. Because they have actually cut funding, I believe. In fact, the Prime Minister is suggesting that rather than being affected by smaller budgets, the Commission's resources are being drained by ill-advised and politically motivated investigations, some of them aimed at him. So what, what the Prime Minister chose to do with, in relation to the Integrity Commission, a body governed by legislation, a, a body included in our Constitution, one of those independent institutions that I have made mention of that set up in our constitution to preserve our democracy is to launch a scathing attack against this body because they are investigating him. When in 2023, in December, because this happened just after December, there was an announcement where it became into the public domain that there was an investigation into certain contracts and so on involving the prime minister. This is what was reported again. Prime Minister Rowley on the Integrity Commission probe for third time. This article by Jensen Levend, dated the 10th of December, 2023. And again, I have to take a deep breath before I read some of these things. Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley has accused the Integrity Commission of deliberately, quote, deliberately attempting to tarnish my reputation after he was informed that he is now the subject of another investigation. And it goes on to say, Rowley, in response to Guardian Media on Friday evening about his latest, this latest investigation, said, and this is what the Prime Minister of this country, the head of the cabinet, the head of the executive, has to say about an independent institution. The Integrity Commission, acting in concert with others, is deliberately attempting to tarnish my reputation by attempting to find ways to associate me with contracts and awards that I have had absolutely nothing to deal with. This is a grand fishing expedition, hoping to slander me by associating me with contracts. Now, well, whether it is correct or not, Minister, it is not for the Prime Minister to come out again. If a Prime Minister sees himself, if a government sees himself as having a duty to uphold public trust and confidence in public institutions, it is not for them to make comments such like that. Mr. President, it is not only our institutions that are under attack. We have situations where private citizens go to, they are invited to speak. We had a situation recently where I saw the retired chairman of a large financial institution in this country make the simple point, the simple point that, that I am making here today, that members of the public uh, should not be mere spectators, that if we see things going wrong, we, may, we should speak out on it, made some comments about us being an oil and gas economy and questioning the plans we had and so on. I listened. I thought the man had some good points to make. I think he's a respectable uh, member of the community. He was invited to this forum to speak. Lo and behold, at the first opportunity, utilizing parliamentary speaking time, the Minister of Energy launched a, again an attack against this private citizen, saying what? Once people become a former, their mouth does get big. <laughs> that is how a government treats with concerns raised by private citizens. Is this a democracy or a dictatorship? When you cannot, as a private citizen, be free to attend a, a consultation or a forum of, of some sort and express a view and speak, because you will be attacked in the parliament of all places where your elected representatives are supposed to be representing your concerns. You are the subject of attack from a sitting senior government minister. Can you say that that is a democracy? We are very, we are moving further and further away 
from the concept and the notion of what is democracy and freedom in this country, Mr. Mr. President. And if we do not act now, everybody will come in for a tongue lashing. Everybody will be um, hounded. Everybody will be subject to criticism and slander by this government. You know, they have a tendency to jump up every time and talk about sub judice. Everything is sub judice, sub judice. But when Senator, people, you have five more minutes. Thank you, Mr. President. But when persons are seeking redress or are the subject of an investigation, they will go to every panyard in this country and talk about them. <laughs> they go into every panyard in this country to talk about matters that are under police investigation. They go into every panyard. They cannot come in the parliament and give proper explanations. They cannot communicate policy, but they will go and sit on the panyard and talk about issues and things that are under investigation. We asked for an investigation into, and have been calling for information about this debacle that is playing out at the Strategic Services Agency, what is supposed to be the premier intelligence gathering agency in this country that is tasked with pre, uh, upholding and, 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 and supporting our national security efforts and our fight against crime. They don't want to talk about it in the parliament. They don't want to answer questions. Everything is under police investigation, but they will sit down in the panel and talk about it because they have the opportunity to slander people's name and scandalize them. And that is their idea of democracy. And they don't to come here to talk about, we ask questions at the appropriate place and in the appropriate forum, yeah. not in the panyard. Oh, yes, yes. That is what a parliament is for. Yes. 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 Parliament is not to come here and, 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 and spread uh, propaganda and make bacchanal, yeah. right? That is what we are here to do. We are here to ask questions and you are here to answer. Some people have to read the same answer twice because like, they fall asleep today and they couldn't even answer properly on key issues of national security. But we come before committees of the parliament and ask for answers and we are shut down because there's an investigation ongoing and we will not comment. But the next week they in the panyard talking about it. Mr. President, I raise this motion because it is something that we need to discuss. We need to look at our institutions. We need to look at the consistent and persistent attacks being thrown at our public officers. We need to look at the way that this government has decided to dismantle the public service and in, by so doing to try to get as much control as they possibly can. We need to look at public perception. We need to look at how the office of the president even was dragged into disrepute by the actions of this government when it comes to the appointments of very important offices in this country, such as the commissioner of police. We need to look at whether or not there's a deliberate attempt to starve important institutions like the Integrity Commission and the Office of the DPP of resources because members of the government know that those offices have the power to investigate them. And every time they get vexed about a matter being discontinued, they cannot levy spite against the Office of the DPP because that's what happened when the PRCO matters were discontinued and everybody knows it. And when you have reports such as those reports coming out from World Justice Project, such as the reports coming out from Transparency International and so on, where Public confidence is at the ultimate low. I dare say our democracy, our way of life, and what we know to be the enshrined cornerstone principles of our constitution are under threat and are being consistently whittled away. And therefore, we as responsible parliamentarians must examine these issues, must try to find solutions, and must call on this government. And this motion is simply a call to the government to cease and desist from this type of behavior. At the rate we are going, I expect by next week we might see another bill where they're trying to interfere with the appointment of a commissioner of police because that seems to be something that is on their mind and occupying their time <laughs> and, and whatever they want to do. And so I have to say that, you know, as much as they have been corrected time and time again by arms of the state that have the obligation to correct them like the judiciary, they are relentless and they will not stop in their attack on our democracy and therefore we are here to raise this motion in an attempt to edu educate the population and remind them of what is taking place so that they make better decisions when the time comes. That they will make better decisions when the time comes 
and that you don't have to participate or read about yourself and your country in international reports as being a place where 80% of people do not have confidence in the rule of law. Because that is a sad state of affairs for any person to be living in. And it should not be the way that we are living in 2024. But unfortunately, that is what it is. And so, Mr. President, with those few words, I beg to move. Senator Mark.